House Speaker Nancy Pelosi at the end of Trump's address, sitting right behind him and ripping up her copy of the speech in two. Immediately afterwards, reporters caught up with her as she left the House chamber. Madam Speaker, what did you think of Trump's speech tonight? I tore it up. Why did you rip the speech up, Madam Speaker? Because it was a courteous thing to do, considering the alternative. Zing! Now, as you may remember, the Republican Party then immediately fell into this hysterical pearl clutching over standards of decency and decorum, which was pretty rich given the standards of decency and decorum generally observed by the sitting Republican president. But when Donald Trump himself was asked about it a couple days later, he took it even further. Well, I thought it was a terrible thing when she ripped up the speech. First of all, it's an official document. You're not allowed. It's illegal what she did. She broke the law. It's illegal. She broke the law. That happened two years ago today. And friends, those comments have not aged well. Now, first of all, in case this needs clarifying, Nancy Pelosi did not break the law. But there is someone with a well-known history of actually destroying official presidential records. Politico was the first to report back in 2018 that President Trump had a habit of ripping up documents and that federal government record specialists found themselves rescuing Trump's hand-shredded papers and trying to scotch tape them back together, even some that were torn into confetti-sized pieces. Because there is a law the Presidential Records Act, requiring that, uh, as you know, presidential records be properly preserved and stored by the National Archives. Sure enough, when the January 6th investigation started receiving Trump White House records that Trump had fought for months to block them from getting, some of them had indeed been ripped up and taped back together. And this week, the Washington Post reported that, quote, Trump's shredding of paper was far more widespread and indiscriminate than previously known. Throughout his presidency, staffers made a habit of coming in behind Trump to retrieve the piles of torn paper left in his wake and then, quote, jigsawing the documents back together with tape. And it went beyond just tearing things up. Quote, one senior Trump White House official said he and other White House staffers frequently put documents into burn bags to be destroyed rather than preserving them and would decide themselves what should be saved and what should be burned. When the January 6th committee asked for certain documents related to Trump's efforts to pressure Vice President Mike Pence, for example, some of them no longer existed in this person's files because they had already been shredded, end quote. A former senior Trump official said of Trump, quote, he didn't want a record of anything. Now, I guess one simple, straightforward way to describe that might be this. It's an official document. You're not allowed. It's illegal what she did. She broke the law. Donald Trump apparently also took a whole bunch of president, presidential records with him when he left the White House and just stuck him at his golf club in Florida. The Washington Post reports today that the National Archives had to go retrieve 15 boxes of records from Mar-a-Lago that should have been turned over when Trump left the White House. And the National Archives says that Trump's staff are, quote, continuing to search, end quotes, for additional records that may have been thrown into Trump's U-Haul when he left the White House for Mar-a-Lago. The Post and now the New York Times both report that the contents of the 15 boxes include correspondence between Trump and the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, as well as a letter that President Obama left for Trump when Obama left office. According to the Times tonight, also in the boxes is, amazingly, this, the National Weather Service map that he altered with a Sharpie during a hurricane briefing in 2019. Now, you will recall that he used a Sharpie to change the projected path of a hurricane in order to match what he had incorrectly said about the hurricane's path in a tweet. Dear Leader's tweet obviously couldn't be wrong, so an entire weather system had to be altered by Sharpie to match it. Yes, that Sharpie Gate map definitely belongs in the National Archives. We need a record of it, mostly because the people of the future will not believe that something so ridiculous ever happened. 
As for how those 15 boxes end up at Mar-a-Lago instead of at the National Archives, the Times reports that it happened during a hasty exit from the White House when, instead of packing up like a president planning to leave office in accordance with the law should have been, quote, Mr. Trump had spent the bulk of the presidential transition trying to find ways to stay in power. At the time, Mr. Trump's aides were either preoccupied with helping him overturn the election, trying to stop him, or avoiding him. We're joined now by Michael Schmidt on the January 6th committee. He writes that their goal is not just to hold hearings and write a report. They are hoping that their work will lead to criminal prosecutions. The investigation is, quote, borrowing techniques from federal prosecutions, employing aggressive tactics typically used against mobsters and terrorists as it seeks to break through stonewalling from former President Trump and his allies and develop evidence that could prompt a criminal case. The committee, which has no authority to pursue criminal charges, is using what powers it has in expansive ways in hopes of pressuring the Attorney General Merrick Garland to use the Justice Department to investigate and prosecute them. Michael, uh, good to see you. Thank you for uh, joining us. And, And your reporting tonight gets to a question that I think is on every viewer's mind. Uh, What can this committee do, given the running out the clock and the stonewalling that it continues to get from some people around uh, the Trump orbit? And and what your reporting describes is very much what I'm used to as a a business journalist when, when you see the government go after a company where they start and they just move their way up and they figure out ways to get to central characters, even if the central characters won't participate. I think that's right. The committee has done uh, is taking an aggressive stance for several reasons. One of them is that a lot of the attempts to hold Donald Trump accountable, whether it was the Mueller investigation, the two impeachments, the other congressional investigations that have gone on, those all, while they did political damage to Trump and he ultimately lost the, the election, Donald Trump still looms and has not changed his behavior and continues to push push his brand of Trumpism down into the country in ways that really concerns Democrats and anti-Trump Republicans. So they're taking the most aggressive stance that we've seen in any recent congressional investigation and going out and getting phone records that's sweeping up personal data of a lot of different people. And they're using link analysis, a tool that the FBI used in the years after the September 11th attacks to identify terrorist networks to see who was talking to who. They've looked at the the org chart of the White House and of who was around the president. And they've said, OK, well, if Mark Meadows isn't going to talk to us and if this this other senior official is going to talk to us, who were the aides that were right underneath them and who were the aides underneath them and what did they know? Because they noticed when they went down the ladder, in the same way that you go down the ladder if you were looking at a mob organization, those people can be more vulnerable. They may be less loyal to the person at the top. Certainly, the younger you are, the less money you have to hire a high-end, white-collar criminal defense lawyer to defend you and to try and stop the committee from getting your phone records or stop the committee from questioning you. So the committee is doing this to your point for for to one to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th and everything in the lead up to it, but also because they are trying to come up with as much damning evidence as possible to pressure Merrick Garland. They see this as their best opportunity to try and get the Justice Department to do something. Garland has given no indication, there's been no public indication that 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 he's investigating Trump or that, that the investigation of January 6th is headed in that direction. And what the January 6th committee, if it if it could have its way, it would develop as much in, much damning information as possible and be able to tie it in, you know, in good faith, in a good faith argument to the criminal code and say to the Justice Department, OK, we went out and did this investigation. Here is what we found. These are the criminal laws that we think have been violated and you should do something. And they would probably make something like that public. And that would. At the very least, I think, force the Justice Department to at least publicly address the question of what they're doing in regards to Donald Trump. Now, Merrick Garland has shown 
immense independence in his short period of time as attorney general. And he may just sort of try and ignore it. But there is the Democratic Party is being pushed. You know, the Democratic leaders on the Hill are being pushed by their base, which wants Trump held accountable. And at the center of this is Liz Cheney, who wants to use the most aggressive techniques possible. She is she is considered on the committee to be the most aggressive member. She says we are going to get criticized no matter what we do. They're they're going to come after us no no matter what we do, and they're not going to cooperate no matter what we do. So we have to use every tool possible. And that is why the January 6th investigation looks different than many, many, many other investigations that we've seen come out of Congress. So there's great reporting that you've got today, but there's also one big asterisk uh, in which you say the committee's aggressive approach carries with it another obvious risk that it could fail to turn up compelling new information about Mr. Trump's efforts to hold on to power after his defeat, defeat or to make a persuasive case for a Justice Department prosecution. After all, Mr. Trump survived years of scrutiny by the special counsel in the Russia investigation. Robert S. Mueller III and two impeachments. Despite a swirl of new investigations since he left office, the former president remains the dominant force in Republican politics. I, I mean, in fairness, we are learning new things that we didn't know during the impeachment. W what's the point here, that we're not learning new things that fundamentally change anyone's thinking about what happened? We just have more details about what we already know. Well, in many ways, I think January 6th may be one of the most important historical events, certainly to happen in my lifetime, um, you know, that 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 I've witnessed in other ways, um, you know, and, and because of that, we, we need to learn as much as we can about it. How did it happen? Who was behind it? Who were the intellectual uh, people coming up with the, the underpinnings of it, the plans of it? Uh, who, who, who was executing things? How did this all happen? How did thousands of people end up on the steps of the Capitol in a violent, in, in a violent attack that led to deaths and to the interruption of you know, one of the most sacred parts of our democracy? On the other hand, what else do you need to know about January 6th to change your mind about what happened? Donald Trump said everything out loud. Right. He still defends what he did. He is as open about it as possible. So there are two, two sort of like competing, competing issues here. And, and look, we are going to get to the bottom as, of, as much of it as possible. It is a highly important event. I think the committee runs into to difficulty when the report comes out because they have made a lot of news. They put subpoenas out. They are the ones that put the subpoenas out every week, generating the stories about the people that they want to question and get documents for. And all of that has a beat to it, a momentum to it, that, that shows that this investigation is moving forward. Now, when that report comes out and when they're done, where will that momentum have left the committee? Will the committee have a, a new narrative, an entirely new appendage of the efforts to overturn the election that changed the way that we look at January 6th? Or will it just be an evidence-based version of media and book accounts of it? We, we don't know, but the expectations are high because the committee has put so much time and effort into this and has generated so much news. So so it'll it'll be interesting to see where they end up. What do they know um, that we don't know? And, you know, in any investigation, I guess that's the real question. The state of Alabama is divided into seven congressional districts. The one outlined in red is the seventh. It's the only district in which the majority of the people who live there are black. In 2020, when the United States collected census data, the number of African-Americans living in Alabama had increased. Meanwhile, the number of white people living in Alabama decreased. And yet, when Republicans in Alabama updated their congressional maps based on the new census data, they didn't account for the change. Under the new Alabama maps, the state would still only have one majority black congressional district out of seven, despite the fact that roughly one quarter of Alabama residents are black. Now, the new maps were subsequently challenged in court, and a three-judge panel ruled that the new Alabama congressional maps violated the Voting Rights Act. And to fix it, 
Alabama would need to redraw the lines to create a second majority black congressional district. State of Alabama appealed that ruling to the Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to put a halt on the lower court's mandate that they add a second majority black district. And today, the Supreme Court did that. In a 5-4 to four ruling, the Supreme Court reinstated the old Alabama congressional map, the one with just one majority black district. They essentially put that lower court ruling on ice until the full case can be heard before the Supreme Court. However, that's not going to happen, probably, until the fall, which means for now, all el elections in Alabama will be held according to the old map. The ruling has the potential to erode voting rights, not just in Alabama, but it could have lasting implications for the entire country. Joining us now is Janae Nelson, the Associate Director uh, and Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, which is representing the plaintiff that brought this case. Ms. Nelson, thank you for being with us this evening. This is a bit of a liars and a truth tellers thing, because the, the, the Supreme Court, um, in uh, Justice Kavanaugh's opinion on this, suggests that they are acting in the interests of the citizens and the voters of Alabama by not allowing changes to the maps, uh, as they say, too close to an election. Tell me what's wrong with that argument. There's a lot wrong with that argument. It allows a map to stay in place that a three-judge federal court found to be discriminatory against Black Alabamians. We at the Legal Defense Fund represent, along with our co-counsel, the National and State ACLU, we represent individuals and Black organizations in Alabama that have filed a lawsuit under the Voting Rights Act alleging that the new map that you just displayed is a dilution of Black voting power. And we went through an entire seven-day hearing with 17 witnesses, with a panel of judges, two of whom were Trump appointees, that means the majority of the panel were Trump appointees, and they, after hearing the record evidence, decided in a 225-page decision that the map that you displayed on the screen was racially discriminatory, that it did not reflect the population shift in the 2020 census, that it did not reflect the state's ability to draw a second district that would enable Black Alabamians to elect candidates of choice. That is a violation of the Voting Rights Act. It's clear the record supported that, and a district court saw fit to enjoin the implementation of those maps. Unfortunately, the state of Alabama petitioned the Supreme Court to stay that injunction, and the Supreme Court, based on a principle, not even actual law and precedent, but on a principle that was articulated in a case out of 2006 called Purcell, the court, in a, in a concurring opinion, we only have the concurring opinion to give us some sense of the court's thinking and reasoning on this, decided that allowing the maps to be re redrawn within seven weeks of the, of the earliest date of the kickoff of the election would somehow be disruptive and violate a principle that, as I said, is not in fact law, but is a notion that has come to govern election law cases in the past several years. So we are deeply disappointed that the court erected this barrier, this barricade to voting rights and to political participation for Black Alabamians, the upshot is that this doesn't conclude our work, not, not by any stretch. We will continue to litigate this on the merits, and that same record that allowed us to win before the district court should, if law is just, allow us to win before the Supreme Court. Which means you will, you will, you will go, you will argue it before the Supreme Court. It, it will, it will be a real case. Is there, is there some sense, though, given the way the Supreme Court has been acting? And I should point out, the Chief Justice uh, voted with the minority um, today against the the decision that was uh, that was taken. Is there some sense that things will change because people make because people like you make a, a better argument? We can only hope that that's the case. We can only hope that the Supreme Court is still a court that follows the rule of law, that when presented with a decision that is well-reasoned, that is thorough as the one that we received is, the 225-page decision from a court that heard seven days of evidence and spoke to 17 witnesses and evaluated all of the evidence with deliberation, unlike what the court did here, where it decided this on its shadow docket, without any arguments on the briefs, when the Supreme Court finally gives this case a full hearing 
which Black Alabamians and every person in this country deserves, we expect that the court will do the right thing and, and recognize that this is a clear and blatant violation of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you.